Hello and welcome to this video on gender and educational achievement, external and internal factors. In the UK education system, one of the interesting outcomes is that there is a gender gap in educational achievement. We find that uh, one gender tends to do much better than another gender, and for us as sociologists, we're interested in why. So along with social class and ethnicity, gender has a big impact on people's experience of education. While both sexes have raised their level of achievement generally, girls outperform boys. However, not much change has occurred with regards to the subject choice, which is what we refer to as sex typing. That is to say, some subjects are still seen as being very male or female, and only boys or girls choose those subjects. Thinking about some actual statistics with regards to the gender gap in achievement, we'll look at some stats from the Department for Education in 2013. Firstly, upon starting school, girls are more likely to score higher in tests, be able to concentrate for longer, and can write their own name and spell it correctly earlier than boys. So we're thinking, you know, really early on, thinking about uh, nursery and reception. Uh, we generally find that girls from the off are more interested, more engaged in education, and start to show to be able to do certain things that boys can't. It seems to take uh, boys a little bit longer to settle down. In terms of key stage one to three, so we're looking here really at primary school, girls consistently do better than boys, especially in English. And generally we find that in languages and language-based subjects, girls do better than boys. At GCSE, girls are 10% more likely to achieve five GCSEs A star to C grades. Now, it's that five GCSEs A star to C, which is considered by the government to be the standard of achievement. So if you got those, you achieved. If you did not get those, then you're thought to have underachieved in education. We find that girls are more likely to get those grades. Finally, at AS and A level, the gap finally begins to narrow, but girls continue to be ahead with 95.8% of girls passing two or more A levels to 94% of boys. By the time we get to higher education and bachelor's level, generally the gap disappears entirely. Uh, although that said, we are starting to find as time goes on uh, over the last 20 or years or so that actually more and more girls are attending university than boys. Um, and actually many working class boys are seeing university as something which is not for them and they're you know, deciding not to even attempt to attend at all. In terms of external factors and gender differences in achievement, here we're thinking about what's going on outside the education system. So the rapid improvement in results by girls may have been attributable to factors occurring outside of the education system, namely the impact of feminism, changes in the family, changes in women's employment, and girls' changing ambitions. Firstly, the impact of feminism. Feminism is a movement that strives for equal rights for women in all areas of life. It seeks to challenge traditional stereotypes regarding gender roles, and it's done this fairly successfully. Whereas generally in traditional societies and in parts of Europe and the world over, there's been different roles for men and women. We've had, you know, the male roles generally been the breadwinner role, providing for the family, whereas, you know, women's roles generally been that of homemaker, bringing up children, cooking and cleaning, and this sort of thing. Feminism has sought to challenge those stereotypes and those gender roles, uh, believing that they inhibit uh, the freedom of women, and prevent them from have enjoying equal rights in other areas of life. Whilst the aims of feminism have not been fully realised, many feminists would argue, much nonetheless has still been achieved. And for example, McRobbie undertook a study involving a comparison of girls' magazines from the 1970s and the 1990s, and found that uh, the expectations that girls had for their lives were very different in those magazines. Uh, generally speaking, in the 1970s, girls thought that um, you know, their lives are going to be focused on you know, having children, being a wife, um, you know, staying in the home and you know, cooking and cleaning, this sort of thing. Whereas in the 1990s, there was also focus on the idea of being a strong, independent person in your own right, who is financially independent, who um, you know, maybe puts off having relationships, setting down, settling down, having kids and this sort of thing until after career goals have been achieved. Feminism has affected women's self-esteem and ambition. So today, young girls and young women and women in general um, have higher ambition. They want to achieve more. They want to do more. They see themselves as having a career, having a job for a prolonged period of time. They may want to own property in their own right. Um, and they don't simply see themselves as being future mothers and wives. Secondly, changes in the family. So since the 1970s, there have been several major changes to the family. For example, there's been an increase in the divorce rate, an increase in cohabitation, a decrease in first marriages, 
and increasing lone parent families, typically headed by women and generally smaller families. And so these changes in the family arguably see, can help women to be liberated, to be freed up, to once again pursue their own careers, to do their own thing. And as a result, they may decide they want to work harder in education as a younger person in order to get qualifications so they can get um, you know, the jobs that they so desire. This has affected girls' view of education. Single mums act as a role model for young girls. So if we imagine the scenario where, say, a young girl is growing up in a family where it is a single parent family and that parent is a mother, that girl's going to be seeing mum going out, getting a job, working hard, paying the bills, providing for the family, and that's going to be an inspiring role model. And some young girls may want to, you know, not only um, perhaps emulate what their mum has done, but perhaps even try and beat it, go the next step, have a better job, own a better house, and these sorts of things. So it's an inspiration and a motivation to work hard in education and try and get those top grades. Next then, looking at changes in women's employment. So two big acts of parliament were instituted in the 1970s in the United Kingdom. Firstly, the Equal Pay Act of 1970. So prior to 1970, it was absolutely legal for companies and businesses to pay women less than men simply because they were women. And this happened quite a lot. It was a discriminatory practice, it was a prejudice practice. There was a belief that firstly uh, women couldn't do the jobs that men could and if they were in the same job that the work they would be producing would be somehow inferior and so they used to be paid less or at the very least men were paid more than women because they were men. We also have the Sex Discrimination Act in 1975 which made it illegal to discriminate against someone on the grounds of their sexual gender. So no longer could, for example, if two applicants apply for a job and one was a man, one was a woman, no longer would it be acceptable or legal for the boss or the person doing the hiring process to say, well, I'm going to choose the man over the woman because I just prefer men or I think men are going to work better. So that's gone now. That's something that disappeared as a result in the 1970s. There have been problems with it. It's not always been properly in implemented. But generally speaking, it's seen as a very successful, both have seen a very successful pieces of legislation. Next, the proportion of women in employment uh, rockets from 47% in the 1959 to around 70% in 2007, and it's probably ever so slightly higher uh, than that even today. The pay gap uh, between men and women since the 1970s has fallen from 30% to 70%. By that we mean the amount of money that men and women are being paid, uh, and in particular when they're in the same role. So, um, you know, what we're finding is whereas in the 1970s men were on average throughout either the whole year or throughout the whole working career were being paid an awful lot more than women. That is starting to narrow. There is still a pay gap, but uh, things have improved. Women are breaking through what is known as the glass ceiling. So uh, many women um, stated that, you know, from the sort of the 1970s on, prior to that, but up until very recently, that when they were in working in their careers, working their way up the career ladder in a business or company, they felt that they would get to a certain point and they no longer could get any higher. It's almost as if there was a glass ceiling between them and the top jobs. And they could see those jobs, but those jobs were going to men. And they refer to this as the glass ceiling. Increasingly, we're finding that women are smashing the glass ceiling and are starting to get into those top jobs, those high-paid jobs, those highly prestigious roles. And this is seen as a positive. This is seen as something which is a product of changes in women's employment and, again, that impact of feminism. It ultimately provides a motive for working hard in school because girls now, if they realise that they can get the top jobs, that they can pay fairly, they're not going to be discriminated against, well, it acts as a motivation for them to work hard, get those qualifications, and then ultimately go on to do those jobs. Finally, girls' is changing ambitions. So, two studies here. Firstly, Sue Sharp in 1994 interviewed girls in the 1970s and 1990s, so it's a fairly ongoing study, very long study. She found that there was a major shift in how girls viewed their future. In the 1970s, girls had low aspirations, saw educational success as unfeminine, and stated their priorities were love, marriage, husbands, children, jobs, and careers in that order. So, you know, girl, uh, sorry, um, Shul Sharp was looking to these girls, talking to these girls, interviewing them, asking them about how they viewed their future. And in the 1970s, they had a fairly sort of dim view of their future, if you will. They saw it as very limited. Their, their view was, well, ultimately, I'm going to be married, I'm going to be a housewife. That's my job. And actually, who would want to be educationally successful or successful in the workplace? Because that would be unfeminine. And maybe even that would prevent me from getting a, a boyfriend or a husband or a future partner. By the 1990s, however, the priorities had completely changed. And now having a career and being financially independent were the aim, were the absolute aim. 
Next, Becky Francis in 2001 interviewed girls and found that they now had very high aspirations. Very few saw their futures in traditional female roles, whether that be as a housewife or going on and taking up jobs which are viewed as feminine. So things like being a secretary, being a PA, uh, working in care, whether that be nursing or childcare, um, and these related roles. These are sort of the roles that are seen as being quite feminine even today, and increasingly girls don't want those types of jobs. They want to go into jobs that interest them in areas that may have traditionally been seen as masculine. And ultimately, therefore, they desired educational qualifications in order to get those better jobs, those better paid jobs, those um, better valued jobs in our society. <clears throat> now to consider internal factors and gender differences in achievement. Whilst factors outside school or college or the education system may play an important part in explaining gender differences in achievement, Factors within the education system are also important. Specifically, we're going to look at equal opportunities policies, positive role models in schools, GCSEs and coursework, teacher attention, challenging stereotypes in the curriculum, and selection and league tables. Firstly, thinking about equal opportunities policies. Feminist ideas are now widespread in education and British society, and there is now a basic belief in gender equality, uh, which is a social norm. So, we believe in the UK that boys and girls can achieve equally, um, that they're equally worthy, and that they require equal support and understanding and so on and so forth. Programmes have been set up by the government such as GIS, which was Girls into Science and Technology, and the aim here is to try and get girls and, uh, into subjects which perhaps traditionally or historically weren't subjects which girls tended to study. And so in particular we're thinking about obviously the sciences and the technologies, um, and engineering related subjects. We also have the national curriculum which was introduced in the 1980s and here all students are now studying the same subjects and it made science compulsory so there had previously been situations where um, girls had been able to opt out of um, studying science uh, and choose other subjects which perhaps they felt were more related to them or more feminine. Now with the introduction of the national curriculum all students study more or less the same subjects up until a certain age. We've also seen the implementation and the growth of meritocracy, the idea that one should be rewarded based on one's own merit, one's own hard work, energies, intelligence, and so on. And this has allowed girls to begin to thrive and do very well. Um, uh, whereas perhaps traditionally, we had teachers who often held sexist or misogynistic views and sometimes would reward boys um, for behaviors or for doing certain things. Um, whilst you know, sometimes they would scold or um, you know, tell off the girls for doing other things. So with the introduction of meritocracy, it's given girls more opportunities to prove their educational ability. Next, thinking about role models. There are vastly more female teachers and female head teachers than in the past, especially in primary schools. In fact, the vast majority of people often go through now their entire primary school life have never having had a male teacher. The presence of more female teachers arguably feminizes the learning environment, encouraging girls to see it as part of their gender domain. So because these girls are going to school every day and they're having female teachers throughout all the years in which they're in primary school, or at least the vast majority of them, and that may also be the case in some secondary schools too, girls start to think, well, education's for me. The education is uh, my domain. This is a place where I'm able to relax and work hard and enjoy myself and ultimately achieve. They might therefore perceive educational success as a desirable female characteristic. They may even start to look up to the female teachers and think, well, this clearly is a um, you know, successful woman and I want to be a successful woman too. So I'm going to emulate her behaviours and the things that she's good at, which apparently is education. So I'm going to work really hard at that. Next, thinking about coursework. According to Mitsos and Brown in 1998, girls do better than boys in coursework as they are better organised and mature earlier than boys. So coursework wasn't always something which was available at GCSE. It was something which was, again, implemented uh, late 80s, early 90s, um, and then grew exponentially. And interestingly, we see an interesting connection between um, how, as girls have improved, the use of coursework has spread. Gorar found girls' results increased sharply when just to see coursework was... Next, looking at stereotypes in learning materials, studies of reading schemes and textbooks have shown that in the past, 
girls were both underrepresented or presented as subordinate to males. So if we were to look at some historic examples of reading schemes in primary schools or um, textbooks, math, science, and this sort of thing, we often find that either girls were entirely absent, there just weren't any girls or very many strong female um, characters, or when they were there, they were shown as being subordinate to males. So their role was one which was supporting you know, the main male character in the reading scheme. Or if there were, you know, say, um, an example being used with boys and girls in it in a math textbook and say, you know, there was an equation and Johnny thought the answer was nine and Sally thought the answer was 11, Johnny would almost always be right. And again, it was almost sort of intimating that somehow boys were cleverer or boys were better at education. This has now been uh, thoroughly reviewed and challenged and many of these sexist images have now been uh, replaced with more positive images, boosting girls' perceptions and aspirations, so that when girls are reading these reading schemes or using these textbooks, they begin to think to themselves, well, you know, girls are as clever as boys, they can achieve, I can achieve, I'm going to seek to emulate that. Next, thinking about teacher attention. Spender, in 1983, found that teachers spend more time interacting with boys than girls. French and French found that similar amounts of attention were spent on both genders for academic reasons. So the extra time or energy or effort that um, teachers were spending with the boys rather than the girls often was actually to tell them off. It was often to do with um, behavioural issues rather than actual um, learning or educational reasons or issues. So boys got more overall because of misbehaving requiring discipline. France has found that teachers had lower expectations of boys and disciplined them more harshly. So, um, you know, teachers almost expect boys to underachieve. They perhaps are pushing them less or challenging and stretching them less. And when it comes to disciplining them, tended to sort of, you know, really jump on them or jump down their throats and sort of discipline them harshly. Swan found that boys dominate class discussions with girls preferring more group work and this finds favour with the teacher. If you think about how group work operates, generally the idea is that students are sort of quietly talking to each other and jotting down their ideas or answering questions. Teachers quite like that mode of um, working in classrooms. They think it's good and so therefore perhaps they're more likely to verbally reward girls, whereas boys who perhaps enjoy being independent more and answering questions in that sense um, on their own, perhaps that's why they dominate the class discussions. And it could also be why perhaps teachers um, view them in a negative light, might seem as boisterous or over the top or loud. Next, selection and league tables. Schools are incentivized to try and recruit more able students to secure a good league table position. We know that schools are competing for that top league table position, and so they want to try and get the best students possible. We find that girls are more successful than boys, and therefore they are more attractive to schools. So there are more um, all-female schools than there are all-boys schools or male schools. Um, at the same time, when we do have a mixed school, co-ed school, what you generally find is that um, uh, the school would seek to try and get more girls on their role than they will boys. Boys are lower achieving and more badly behaved, or at the very least are perceived as being so. They're often seen as a liability who will give the school a bad image and produce a poor results. So there's an incentive there to almost have less boys. Girls are therefore more likely to get a space in a school. Girls get a better education and achieve more. So again, this is all going to be aiding these um, you know, better grades that we're seeing that girls are achieving especially at GCC, but throughout the education system. In terms of two views of girls' achievement, we've got two different sets of feminists here, the liberal and the radical, and we're going to consider what they have to say. Firstly, liberal feminists applaud the progress in improving girls' achievements so far. They believe further progress will be made by, firstly, continue to develop equal opportunities policies, encouraging positive role models for girls, overcoming sexist attitudes and stereotypes, and in particular, really challenging that when it's apparent or it's overheard um, by teachers amongst groups of boys or all male peer groups. Liberal feminists believe education is a meritocracy. So they take a fairly positive view of the education system in the UK today and would say that it's broadly working, that it is a meritocracy and girls are you know, achieving more and more as time goes on. Whereas if we compare to radical feminists, they take a more critical view. They argue the system is still patriarchal or male dominated. It is still a man's world therefore. They argue that sexual harassment of girls still occurs in schools, whether that be you know, female students being harassed by either male students or sometimes male teachers, but also uh, on occasion you have female teachers who are being harassed by either other teachers or by male students. So that's something that needs to be challenged, radical feminists would argue. That subject choices and career options are still limited for girls, although much has been done to challenge stereotypes 
there is still problems in this area. There are some sort of lingering stereotypes that still abound. And we do find, for example, that peer groups, whether that be male or female, kind of police each other's behavior and each other's choices. And that if a girl does decide she wants to study something which is seen as being you know, very traditionally male, perhaps something like uh, engineering or construction, that um, uh, verbal abuse will be used to try and sort of challenge that girl and trying to bring her back to the straight and narrow as it were. So there is perhaps issues still there. Male teachers are still more likely to become head teachers than female teachers. So although this is changing, there is still uh, an imbalance here. And women are still underrepresented in the curriculum, and in particular in history, where history has often been referred to as a woman-free zone. And if we think about that word history, it has the word or his at the front of it. And some radical feminists perhaps we need, said that we perhaps now need to consider uh, her story, her story, rather than just history or his story. That's it. Thank you very much.